afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming for the first session of the afternoon. Okay, now we are getting into the art of living on a specific topic. Design is social. It's no longer um, a discovery or a pioneering attitude. We design how we can regenerate the world. We are doing it by drawing on science and art, but more importantly, we look toward the community to find solutions on our collaborative or collective future. Toshiko Mori lead the way to show how the dynamic and social nature of design requires a re-education. Toshiko Mori is an architect who I respect a lot. She is doing, and the way she is doing it, assimilates sensitivity to the environment. Into her project, you can find that sensitive touch at every aspect of details. She has a very special touch to create something so minimal yet so magnificent. When I saw the school that she just designed just lately, I was in Senegal, by the way, in Africa. It inspired me to be inside, to be sitting with the children. She used to say, and this is one of the quotes that I took from her long uh, biography, Today's design aims for circular, cyclical pattern to enhance connectivity and ecology. We look forward to hearing from Toshiko Mori now. So please welcome on stage Toshiko. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for introduction and thank you everybody for being here. Um, uh, today's talk is very quick talk, but I talk about first about building as an architect, and this is the Syracuse University Center for Energy and Environment. It's on the site which is shown in green, but it's a brownfield. It's a contaminated site. It was given free of charge from a city. The task was to design a building on this uh, negative asset into a positive asset to design a building which can uh, produce its own resources from its own footprint. It's beyond sustainability. It exists between a city and university. It's a collaboration between scientists, climate scientists, engineers, and us to really come up with a prototype of a building which is a living lab constantly monitoring its own performance. And it's beyond, it's a platinum, leap platinum, but in a sense, it's really designed that uh, it's including water and energy, it's designed to live its own life or on its own footprint. Syracuse is a region where Iroquois Indians existed. It's a previous inhabitant, Native Americans. And they had a great log. It's uh, called seven generations in which every decision that has to be made has to, in consequence, of seven generations ahead of you. So with that particular principle, it was a learning experience to a lot of extent. And also design as a social, as an architect, when you go into a community, a local community in Maine, a very small fishing community, to propose a contemporary art museum, which is a very new facility. This idea is not only to propose an institution, but institution which has a public space the museum has given a courtyard, which is open to the public, so that it's open all the time, and museum is visible from its own courtyard, and it provides uh, education, it's free of charge for kids, and then also it becomes a big plaza uh, for the community itself. So consideration for relationship of environment, local, and idea of a community is a very big one, to in order for any architectural building to survive into its future. Also, some corporate projects such as Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research, which is a large, a, a large a facility, uh, Swiss-based pharmaceutical companies, and it's a master plan by Maya Lin, and my building is the very back. But also, idea of social is very important ingredients for scientists. Their research does not involve isolated uh, 
isolated research, but it's really largely dependent on interaction with the colleagues. And to really diagnose uh, taxonomy of different personalities, we had to do analysis from introverts into extroverts to be able to create diverse social environment within it so their interactivity between different scientists can be uh, made in a different ways of exchange of ideas, such as meeting rooms, collaborating spaces, cafe. In a, in a way, these actually can be designed ahead of time, uh, collecting a lot of data and anal analysis, and to predict how they might be able to interact in that instances. Going into much more smaller scale social interactions, I would talk about two projects in New York City. The first one is Brooklyn Children's Museum, in which the canopy was needed uh, on the roof to, for students and the kids to be able to use it on rainy day or very hot sunny day. And there was a limitation in which we had to do a very careful analysis in terms of loading of a new structure, and also everything has to be prefabricated to be brought onto site because the children's museum had to be in operation at all time. It had to be safe and it had no noise. So a lot of prefabrication is considered for these purposes and ETFE. And the weight is only loaded to a three points of existing, so there, there's no uh, importance. But the most of all, what it does in it gives the shading devices for the kids, and also it can be used as rainy day, and it can be used for events in which it produces income for the museum, which becomes significant ways for nonprofit to operate sustainably going into the future. In fact, uh, for the summer months, uh, starting in May, every night is booked for certain events. Okay. And then some of the kids' events during the daytime, it's, it just became a very, very active idea. An idea that is very important for us as an architect, not only just to design buildings, but be able to program it, think ahead of time, and then think of different scheduling aspects and maintenance of a building as well going ahead. So in that sense, I think the kind of what you are trying to do and that's a system of a complete environment, complete ecosystem is a very essential part of what we do as designers at shifting toward that. Another project in New York, which is a Hudson Yard and Boulevard Park, uh, it's an uh, environment and a canopy for subway systems. There has not been any subway coming to this new development, which you have seen opening with the sheds and so forth, enormous amount, but then there was no subway system there. This is a new uh, entrance, uh, first subway system, first subway entrance in the last 25 years in New York, so it's a very big deal. And it has organic shape. This is a collaboration with Schleich Bergman Architects in Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. An idea is to come up with a shape. Uh, if you have ever been to Hudson Yards area in New York, you notice it's incredibly, extremely windy. And then there's uh, analysis we have made, a very careful analysis to come up with a shape which shades it and also does not create a wind tunnel. And purposefully, this mm -hmm. shape is made uh, not as a same shape, which is like a tunnel shape for standard subway station canopy systems in New York City, and convince them to work that way. One is to work with organic shape of parks, but also this shape actually shelters people coming up from the subway against the wind, but also promotes a, a very viable ventilation system. So it's the balance, uh, counterbalancing two aspects of it. It's a incredible, it's simple shape, but it's hybrid of a vault and a dome in itself. It has a lot of careful analysis had to be done to come up with this. And there's a smaller shape. There are two ca uh, canopies being proposed also to precisely fit into the exit strategy of a subway, as you can see it, and also this escalator to be able to carry in one piece. So there are a lot of uh, components and requirements that needed to be done. But mo most of all, I idea is to make it a canopy which is multi-directional so that people in a park can see it from different parts and then they are able to enter it. It becomes iconic but it doesn't overwhelm the scenery beyond and also uh, uh, plants and trees surrounding it. 
This was before the construction. It's one of the first things to go up because you had to get the people to the site. This is before the buildings went up. And then now, this is what it looks like. It is Ewan Barnes' photo of it, the current photo in which Thomas Heatherwick's vessel and also shed is right behind it. But it is in the map to guide to shed because it's the only subway entrance and exits in Hudson Yards. It takes care of about more than 60,000 people daily. So it becomes a very much of a social place and people do identify it. In fact, it, that little canopy handles more than Kiatarava's big station mm -hmm. downtown. So anything small doesn't have to mean that it has a little capacity. In fact, it's one of the most efficient capacity a subway station we, we can think of. And similar idea and techniques of uh, ETFE and also techniques of understanding the environment through environmental analysis, engineering analysis. This is a collaboration with Arab, is an addition to botanical gardens. And this is for the plants, for the display of plants, but more importantly, idea of a botanical garden is more educational, including kids in the area. There's a huge demand, especially in place like this, is Buffalo, New York. It's mostly ice and snow during the time. And then for them to be able to come and enjoy, but we had to provide classrooms. And again, as I mentioned before, Brooklyn Children's Museum community. event spaces for yeah. non-profit. Community gathering. Yeah, yeah, to get together so that there will be weddings, and which is a big revenue, and then social spaces for people in the winter time to have different events. And then in, now it cannot meet the demand of a children in a neighborhood for them to come there to study pot, uh, botany. Mm -hmm. uh, so the wing is nearly all social in, in one sense. And that's actually a developed, uh, parametrically developed using computers and different systems. And then come up with a system which can allow a similar vocabulary was made during uh, even invention of greenhouses, but then interpreted it in a way using membrane structures of course, efficiency and ecology is incredibly important in different ways of a passage through uh, di different exhibits, including butterfly exhibits. And interior can be divided in by curtains for flexibility. And then a relationship between in inside and outside are very close in terms of connecting it to courtyard at different seasons. And, and also to the original structure. So this is mm -hmm. how it is, the new structure is lower than the original historic structure, and it will not visually impact it from a facade, but at the same time, it provides enormous amount of freedom in terms of programming and also uh, housing of a, di a diverse part of uh, botany and the increasing capacity for this institution to include education and social activities. And otherwise, a place like that, Botanical Garden, can be a very obsolete institution. And as an architect, we have to be very careful as to figure out how can uh, something like Botanical Garden can enhance its life into next centuries and coming ahead. Mm -hmm. I would uh, end my talk, short talk, with uh, two projects from Senegal. There's a gentleman from Senegal. <laughs> yes. Um, because it's really about if we know all these technology and techniques and engineering know-how, how can we translate back into communities that they don't have it? Mm -hmm. And we are the 10%, they are the 90%, and how to, instead of imposing, how to include the vernacular architecture and to culture into the new facilities where there may not have been no architecture before. It's a uh, first example is a cultural center in Tambacunda, near Tambacunda, in a village called Cynthian. It's about seven hours drive from uh, Dakar. It's very remote and it's really not wealthy, I would say, one of the poorest communities. And uh, 
idea is to collaborate with the medical community there that operate clinics. Mm -hmm. And there's an art foundation which funded this clinic for the last 20 years, and they asked us to uh, bring in a cultural center there. And one of the reasons is because, uh, yes, uh, clinics had stabilized public health. This was an area of the largest infant and maternal mortality and that has uh, helped to reduce a great deal, nearly to zero, in 20 years. They have built kindergarten, and they have also uh, built uh, agricultural schools in there. So this one is a cultural institution to help unite and stabilize area where 12 tribes might live together. And Senegal is about 90% Muslim, and everybody is quite uh, concerned about increasing fundamental conservative attitude and to increase the awareness to stabilize uh, artistic expression, which may be very necessary here. As an architect, the only thing we had was those African huts. The people are very beautiful, and then women especially are beautiful, men very handsome and colorful clothing, children super cute. And then it's in a flat landscape like this. And poverty means, and remoteness means you cannot really import material from elsewhere. You have to work with existing materials. And plus, we were actually faced with the fact of a shortage uh, of water in this area. So demonstration of this roof design, again, we have done a lot of analysis parametrically and then also even uh, my engineers have used solid works to translate it into mm -hmm. much more accessible local units and to increase the uh, slope for maximum uh, collection of rainwater and to demonstrate that if aquifer is drying, the well is drying, there's an alternative method of collecting usable water here and very uh, in-depth analysis was made in terms of structural stability because we only had African hut and how to use that technique, technology, and known skills to make a larger institution. So that's about 95 feet by 160 feet, which is very large, and how to make the techniques to enlarge it. So in a way, uh, we were able to do an instructive, it's not set of drawings, and they were completely able to build it in a combination of a bamboo structure and a thatch roof. And the kids, instead of going to school, they are helping out, and map bricks made on that area. And then a local thatch maker, we had asked them to make it slightly thicker mm -hmm. so that it's more insulating and then stronger. But when a thatch blows out, it can be replaced very quickly. And this was an analysis a, a doctor has done, and a villager has done about uh, water consumption. And this data was incredibly important, right. one of the most significant data. And I'm afraid New York City doesn't even have this data. Many cities yeah. don't, and it's suffering as a result. So we were able to rationally figure out how to accumulate water and how to use it. And as you can imagine, uh, as water sources becomes remote, it, it's up to kids, especially girls and women, to go to remote places to collect it, which results in so girls. So they don't, not, they, don't do, they don't go to school. That's exactly. So it become a huge social problem as a result. So this was demonstration problem uh, to really show them how one can have uh, uh, rainwater during a dry season in this uh, facility can accumulate about 30% of it. So this shows some local techniques which is embedded into it and uh, gathering and they become it's a really cultural nice. community. It's now four years old in uh, just now, March. Uh, and then uh, local artists, international artists have been coming together the kids come there, there's a solar panel, and uh, they will be charging some mobile things. So I will talk about climate a little bit later, a little library, and the gathering spaces, multiple gathering spaces for multiple uh, components of people, different types of kids to older people working together. Or it, in the opening, it had like 2,000 people from different parts. But now I have to say four years later, the system has become very active. Women have made an uh, agricultural collective. They have started to produce fi fino, which is very fine grain, also producing uh, honey, which is for sale. 
and uh, these ladies in, in front of cisterns, and you can see a very uh, viable agricultural practice. They are growing eggplants and okra, and this kind of community where uh, they can uh, earn $10, uh, one child can go to school for one year. So it's actually a very big economic income. So this is about the social, but I idea of thinking what can, type of economy can be produced and how to make us stabilizing. And this four years later, that's actually what's happening now. And they're wow. also bring, uh, growing moringa, if you know the herbs. It's very strong in yeah. uh, uh, iron. Mm -hmm. And it's very high value price. So they are actually actively doing it. Uh, their honey also contains moringa, which is also high value, uh, really extensively. So most recently, Japanese government with Monaco did an issue called Skills to Share. And I'm in it. There's a cartoon of mine in Senegal, yes. you can see. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so there's exist. something which has been recognized. And Time magazine just listed as world's one of 100 world's greatest places and we villagers are shocked because they don't know what to do with the tourists but it's kind of very nice to get a recognition last project i show as an impact of this um, it turns out to be there's another community more remote from this uh cynthia uh called fast the other side of uh, gambia river which is uh, farthest away part of senegal very dry illiterate community, and then very, very conservative Muslim villagers. But Khalifas have come up to us, and they saw the threat and said they want to build a school for the first time. They have a Quran school, but they do not have a regular school. So we were very much shocked, but we were talking about it. But as an architect, what should the school look like where there's no school before and there's no institutions? And we have to connect many, many different tribes together. And this is a prototype of ancient collective housing in this particular region. I took a cue about it. If it's a collective, why can't we actually make the school look like a large house? In French, we call it uh, l'école maison, mm -hmm. in which is schoolhouse. And in America, there used to be called one-room schoolhouse, in which this is one room and many different kids study together. There are three different classrooms, and then small one is a bathroom to make sure that girls cannot be seen going in or out of it. And the other uh, medium one is a uh, teacher's residence. And uh, it required also this was Schreis Bergman collaboration. We did a very, uh, very, very detailed computer analysis to come up with handmade building as such. And because of a twist of a two arcs, it stabilizes itself, but it also makes a, uh, classrooms very different from each other. As you can see from different sections, it's six very diverse different support. Different so guys. there's no, no, none of the rooms are alike. And usually in this region, uh, Standard classrooms, uh, schoolhouses given to kids are metal roof and concrete blocks. So in a box. In a box. And the roof, as you can imagine, when sun hits it, kids get cooked in it. And then when it's rain, it's very, very noisy. And it's not an uh, attractive environment to take to the kids study. in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my thing is a couple of ideas to how, what's it? What's, it's a new icon for school, new institutions, and also how to attract kids in this particular school beyond visual identity. So uh, this is actually a structural diagram. As I mentioned before in thread, we want to have a thicker roof, a thicker roof than usual. Um, that roof is incredibly ecological. It's actually harvested on that region and also mm -hmm. very efficient because it's still porous, which means it uh, promotes ventilation, but it's thick enough so it does not let the rain come in. And what it does is that uh, it can create a stack effect that hot air can rise and, and slowly go out and let the cool air come in. So this is a very simple idea. The orientation of this hole has to do with the wind direction. It's a very similar idea to the thread. And a thread we've experienced that there's a constant breeze going through because orientation of a courtyard. And this is really a shape of a 
building, as you can see, and openings are placed strategically also to help ventilate, but also above the height of kids. The kids going there are 6 to 12 years old, so they have a privacy, they feel quiet, it's acoustic mm -hmm. quiet, quietness, so it's a big roof, and it's scaleless, so if the kids are walking to school, which that's what all they do, they can see where it is. Yes. And then this kind of shows and, and the relationship. And what is the material of the roof hmm? for this one? What is the material for this roof? It's a thatch, thatch. grass. Yes. It's, which is grown but right it's there. it's very dense. I mean, it looks it's like very it's being dense. And very Yeah, dense. and then it's a local technique, mm -hmm. but I have them make it denser and then a little shorter and a thicker, and which is completely doable. So, and, and also we add some steel there, minimum uh, steel there, to tie it together to take care of a weight and largeness of a roof. So what happens in this area is that it has a cooling effect. And we have also designed very quick furniture for the kids, and they can be made there quickly in different colors. And also we had asked the uh, boys and girls to study together, which is sometimes unusual. And this school has both uh, religious studies and non-religious studies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, learning French, mm -hmm. practical skills as well. And uh, also the floor is a discarded uh, tile, mm -hmm. broken garbage tile to make it into mosaics. And this is how the kids can look in, but when they are sitting, it's completely private. Everything is open so that you, uh, wind is going through here. And that's a classroom. So is, is this, is this, uh, okay. Also, what happens, we did study the shadows very carefully, and I was very attracted to hackathon shadows yes. because uh, as it moves around, it creates a different environment in a courtyard itself so that uh, they can actually have a different activities. They're not completely exposed to the idea. So this is a video. I think I can't seem to activate it. If you... So, Outside at the opening is 105 degrees, and inside a roof is 20 degrees cooler. So everybody's jumping into the idea. An idea for them is to attract the kids in a better environment so they can sit down and focus on the classroom. And maybe you can do a last, last video, please. This is a video also. And this is area of photo. So the idea was it's very, very simple creating a new institution, using the local skill set, local materials. And it's new institution, but what would be attractive, not only the aesthetics and architecture, but creating a social environment, which is much environmentally cooler using natural resources, so that kids can go to cool classrooms and stay there. This actually shows the way they're acting. And you can see the shadows created in a courtyard, which is becoming inside out, so out the outside room as well. So this kind of shows uh, also the context as you go around. This was done by Iwan Ban has done a drone <laughs> of this area. So I think idea for this area is that Illiteracy is the biggest challenge in the world we face today, and I think agreement with this community to be able to build this school and programming it. This school just opened in February, early part of February. Um, as an architect, I think I'm also an educator. The idea to be able to provide a space of education opportunity, I think that's how we can perhaps uh, repair the broken world as we know it. Yes, And exactly. to be able to... Yes grow and educate next generation of kids so they can have more stability in the future. So thank you. Well, thank you, Toshiko. Oh, you know, uh, this is what it's so important that you are sharing, you yeah. know, your practice. Because in reality, people may think of an architect in a very dogmatic and very uh, authori authoritarian, you know, presence and posture. Yeah. And here you are basically giving us really the insightful uh, focus in the overall social responsibility of right, architecture. Yeah. But you are doing it in such, um, I would say, sensible and, and empathic way 
that should be a lesson for any architect in the world. What is being, and strike me, uh, this school, as I said earlier, is, uh, is, is inspire me to be a student there better than any school in France done by Le Corbusier. Yeah. No, I'm telling you, yeah. this is true. Mm. Um, and something also strike me in on this social regeneration is, if anything would change in the way people use this place, actually you can change it. You can regenerate. You can have just the people there to actually change it by their own hands. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just a, a social from a top-down perspective, but very much bottom-up. Bottom up, right. But the first question I would have to you when I was looking at it, because I know your work so well and I'm just so... Um, um, but something just struck me is, uh, you were talking about how do you are learning also to get from your vision, taking empathically what the people need, the, 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 the users that you are really driving by usage. Uh, you were talking about SolidWorks helping you to optimize, you mm. know, where the water will go. And so like that, it was like a friend, a partner in your mm. thinking right. for helping to develop your idea even further, making sure it works. Right. So that would be my first question. But the other one was the, the kids that are being living and studying in those places, they should maybe know how did you think about how you did the environment for them to know how to think that way and be the architect of a place in the future. You right. know, like the full circle of regeneration means mm -hmm. that you give them the way to right. design for having them, not just the making, mm -hmm. the thinking of doing the environment. Right. So I wanted just to let you, uh, uh, how do you think we should be doing uh, to get them access to your thinking? Right, I, I think first, I think access to my thinking, in a way, they have had all, all the way along because they've been always hanging out and looking at and sometimes helping carry bricks and it was fun for them to see the building in construction for both Spignon, projects. The, the, the period where you interact with the, the building, it was a long period of time? Well, it's only one season. It's actually one season, one season because they had to build it in dry season. Mm -hmm. In wet season, they can. So we had a lot of preparation the season before to prepare bricks and acquire everything, but it's just one season to build it. But then the kids will be coming and watching it. And then they'll be asking questions to people, and then people who are working on it, the villagers, they are people they know. So in a way, by seeing it, they acquired some knowledge about it. But in a way, it's more of a sharing for them. It's something they know, and it's something their uncle or brother know building it. Uh, for me, it's not like a top-down education, but more of an empowering like in the par fact that participatory, participatory and it's not like foreign laborers came to build a school for you, but in a sense, it's like, yes, their entire community family is building it. I think that feeling will give them more ownership and empowerment than just top-down education. This is it, this is it. Yeah. Right, and if, uh, I think sooner or later, I think there will be school of architecture there, I, I would say, because it's rapidly changing part of our world, as we know. And that's very aesthetic, built in aesthetic sense. This sensibility is very, very strong. And if you see how the kids dress, everybody's very fashionable and they're not rich, but they actually know, have style, emerging amount of style. So that's one thing. In terms of technology, I think uh, both Schreis Bergman's office, who worked in uh, Southeast Asia uh, enormously, and we too, we share this idea that if we are so technologically advanced, we're so capable, we have so much knowledge, how can we decode it? How yes. can we make it accessible to, make it accessible for to them. the community yes. mm -hmm. but using the best technology possible just because those communities, people don't have choice. We might be able to have a choice which software we use, which clothes we buy, and what furniture we use. They don't have a choice. Whatever they're given, they just don't. And for the people who don't have choices, we feel obliged mm -hmm. that we offer the best that we have cap capability and then uh, bring it down. So there's a gap. There's not going to be a gap between knowledge, sophisticated knowledge and primitive knowledge in both mine and now Sir Bergman's opinion 
these two project uh, structures are highly sophisticated, even though it's, it's a flat roof, big African hut. So it really bridges that's, a gap that, between yeah, that's sophisticated and really, That's yeah. exactly where my question was. But yeah. we may expect that in 10 years from now, young kids that are 6, 10 years old may basically have a study in such environment, right. will be questioning you know, that environment as being different to anything they would have known right. before, yeah. and being interested to architecture, and then starting to build up maybe a community right. of people following your lead in terms of... A, so that's really what regenerative may be. Right. is how and with kind of vernaculars know how you basically get off of the past. But someone like you, yeah. some kind of a mediator, yeah. uh, an ambassador of the technology, mm -hmm. yet being delivered simply and accessible. So you are basically making a huge social transformation because well, they may basically start to will to have not just schools, but the full surroundings mm -hmm. being part of the open imagination for anything. Right, housing, so. uh, maybe industry, uh, I mean, yeah. industry you may have there. Right. Industry in a big eye, you know, inventivity. So, so I, I think my hope is that, as you can see, for even for many architects, Katia has a high hurdle. Yeah. And it's really... It's not, far, it's too far complex, accessible, difficult. And yes. so even so it works, but kids, if you can visualize that jump from their hut to these buildings, they feel more comfortable. Yes. They are in a faster environment. They're like doing a major leapfrog as yeah. somebody like but me. But you trigger hoping, interest. So trigger at least interest. just have the and first step. And they can step. basically jump and leapfrog. To the next into step. A, yeah. So they exactly. pass through all these difficulties and it very become intuitive into how to engage it. Because they can actually see the structure is completely visible. And, and you can understand geometry by studying it and how it actually flares out. It's, it's a school I may have an idea. We should go with uh, some SOLIDWORKS, little, you know, uh, laptop, yeah. going there and asking, having them to reproduce their environment yes, in SOLIDWORKS. Could be a very nice exercise they may be to more have this intuitive. kind of uh, in and out, yeah. understanding the virtual to the physical and yeah. relating. Relating to, to it. Because I think there's some capacity among kids uh, intuitive understanding is very rapid. Yeah, and then oh, I I'm think sure you for do them that, they to be able get to, it. Yeah, embrace it. technology and so that we don't leave, leave them behind, I think. It's including material science and so on. Exactly. There are many uh, structure and yeah. there are many open science discussion and right. knowledge that we can deliver this way right. in context, exactly. in situated context. Yeah. Okay, I would like to open up uh, any question from the room to Toshiko. I think, uh, I hope you all being very inspired uh, to this very important, uh, uh, because this is the future. This is the way we may live in the future, frugal and social oriented architecture. So any question for Toshiko? People being shy. Yeah, funny. <laughs> <laughs> hello. Yeah, hello, uh, Toshiko. Um, I think there are so many things I could go on and on, so I won't. Um, <laughs> one thing uh, I would say is uh, we see here how soft touches can be a political statement. Mm -hmm. There is a political willingness to embrace um, the richness of the local culture because that's uh, something that maybe you know we need to know is that Senegal is known throughout Africa for Terenga which is the hospitality oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, concept they are very proud of it um, and this is what they want to one thing they want to preserve is this hospitality aspect of the country which is threatened by what's going on on, on uh, nearby on the other side of borders and and here there's a local willingness to be careful and to preserve this. And there is uh, buildings as um, polit political statements working with the community. And you have this experience of four years on of, of a building that is embraced by the community. And f for me, this is striking because we used to talk several years ago about white elephants mm. in Africa, buildings that were wanted by um, others and which decayed very rapidly. So... Inadapted. Inadapted. So that's very inspiring. And also remembering that local forces, children to start with, but local people 
have fantastic knowledge and know-how mm. that we should uh, learn from. I yes. think in this moment in time, we need to remember we need to, to learn from. So we remember we need to learn from kids, but we also need to learn from local people whose culture maybe they, they we're not sure whether we should keep our culture because there's so much force co coming the other way through the media. So for me, initiatives like, like this are really inspiring and powerful, and I'm, I re I'm really thankful for it. Okay, yeah, so that you. was not a question, but a, a comment. Statement. Thank you. This was a really insightful comment. Thank you. Any question? So it is very interesting indeed. Uh, just the question I would have, uh, is there a methodology behind that or is this just like your approach or the way you behave with people or do you have a, a theorized uh, the methodology that you would have with many, many different cultures? I, I, since I've done these two projects, uh, I had to approach very carefully not to impose a methodology and so that I have figured out a loose way of a methods. But again, cultures are very sensitive and it's not one formula fits all. So there are looser ways of approaching the communities and speaking and then coming up with it. But I think one has to be a little more flexible and open to observe and listen others rather than coming up your methodology, which can be good for all. So in a way, it's a very creative way of approaching things. And it makes you evolve in your thinking. It, it, it needs to organically evolve, and you need to be com constantly give and take about this. And this is not a method you can solve everything. So, so but if you are open and listening, you can constantly work through everything throughout. So it's so. mostly human and not necessarily any machine or model. No, 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 yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. So I have a question in that continuation of thoughts. Uh, does these two experience that has, to me, for me, very yeah. fantastic, has uh, uh, changed your way you think now working for a Western country, like yeah. going back to New York, to Tokyo, to Paris? Uh, do you really think, I think it did have an impact in your thinking, and you may also consider some changes in the way you design for, right, for right. our cities here in yeah, I think country. so, right. It's, in a sense, it's very interesting because I had to deal with 12 tribes and similar time as programming for Novartis. And I realized... At the same time. Same time. <laughs> so I realized scientists are tribes too. So if I approach them as a tribe or different Very interesting. And then also yeah. I think that's so, you have tribes. Yes, tribes. Right. Yes, we do. <laughs> and how to negotiate <laughs> and how to make that all live together. Uh, it's very, this is very clear, extreme example, but it might take extreme example to really understand the social interaction of what you call developed society, which we still have a trace yes. of this society we carry through. So this, we can't, it was just really a learning experience for me. So. Well, thank you very much, thank Toshiko. You. I think this is the second time you come for Design Age yes, of Experience. Yes. It's always been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, very delightful uh, presentation. And uh, I hope you enjoy it also. Thank you very much. This will conclude this uh, presentation, Future Talk, on design, social, and art of living. Thank you very much. Thank you, Toshiko. Thank you That's so been much. wonderful. Thank you.